I'm glad that song didn't say, when some of us get to heaven. Y'all do know everybody ain't going. I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but everybody ain't going to heaven. Matter of fact, most of the, some of the people that call him Lord, Lord, won't enter in there. <laughs> Just because you come to church and your name's on the roll don't mean give you access into that land. Matter of fact, I dare say being saved when you was 11 years old don't give you access into that land. There is a maintenance that you must provide in your life through prayer, fellowship, word of God, through faith and obedience. And as you journey, your faith deep. You, it's not just one sentence you said a long time ago to God, Lord, forgive me my sin. It's the continuation of your faith and your profession of faith that guarantees that one day you will see Jesus. There are a lot of people think that just because they said it a long time ago that it, everything's all right. Well, what you said shall line up with your lifestyle today. If you are not living and professing or living in conduct that that you professed many years ago, then what you said was empty, vain words, and they have no validity behind them at all. Somebody help me say, hey, I'm not going to preach on that, but that's a good thought. I want to go to heaven. But going to heaven ain't made possible by the works of men. It's made possible through the blood of Jesus. And faith in that blood. And confidence in that blood. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles today to Hebrews chapter 11 and also to Luke chapter 9. I have another scripture in Mark chapter 9 that I will refer to in just a few moments. And... Uh, As I preach. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole chapter for sake of time. But I do want to start around verse 32. And then I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 9. And I just want to read a few verses of scripture out of a story that is unfolding. In the street with Jesus in Luke 9. Do you have it? Say amen. Amen. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 32. I want you to stand. I know we've been standing, but stand just a little while longer, and I'll let you be seated for at least three minutes. The, 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 the writer says here in the book of Hebrews, does everybody have it? If you have it, say, I got it. Amen. In, in Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 32, the apostle Paul, at least to, to, to what some theologians say, and I believe after reading the book of Hebrews, it is the, the author is the apostle Paul. Though it doesn't have his authorship upon it, it has his touch on it. So I will agree with the theologians that say it is his for what it's worth. I believe it is written by the hand of the apostle Paul. He says here in verse 32, after this great discourse of faith, that we all call the chapter of faith, the chapter of the heroes of faith. He says this, and what shall I more say? He kind of feels like I feel today. For the time would fail me, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets. I want you to listen to this very closely. Who? Through faith. Say, somebody shout, through faith. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Can you, can you connect the people that have done these things through faith without their names being attached to what they did? Stop the mouths of lions. Who would that be? Daniel. 
Daniel. He's not mentioned, but what happened is mentioned through faith. Hallelujah. Quench the violence of fire. Three Hebrew boys. Come on, somebody. Escape the edge of the sword. David. Out of weakness were made strong. David. Wax valiant and fight. David. Turn to flight the armies of the alien. David. Women receive their dead, raised to life again. Elisha, come on. And the son that was given to that woman. Mm. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. God, I wish I had time to go there. That they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had tri trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Hmm. Yea, moreover, bonds and imprisoned. They were stoned. Stephen. Come on. They were sawn asunder. Ezekiel. Were tempted, were slain with the sword, and wandered about sheepskins and goatskin. John the Baptist. Being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, Philip Napier. <laughs> Y'all caught that, didn't you? You ever felt like that? I got a laugh out of you today, if nothing else. There are times in our life we feel like that, destitute. Afflicted and tormented. I want you to under, look, at, look at this in parentheses. In verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all having obtained a good report through faith. Get this. Received not the promise. God having provided something better for us that they without us should not be made perfect. That word perfect there means complete. Now I saw a revelation this morning driving to church when I read this. I, I read it over and over and over again and I saw something I'd never seen 33 years of studying the Word of God and being a student of the Word of God, most of which I've been a preacher. I never saw this, and I'll wait to let you sit down to explain it to you. But over in verse th Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, you can be seated. Luke chapter 9, there is a woman who has came into the street. She has an issue of blood. It's amazing to me when you have an issue, you're going to find Jesus. Touch your neighbor and say, you got issues, hallelujah. So find him. And touch him. And if you can touch him while you've got an issue, yours will be made right. Come on, somebody. Your issue may not be blood, but everybody in here has got an issue. Hey, if you're breathing and living, you've got an issue. Your issue may be with your neighbor. It may be with your son or your daughter. It may be with your husband or your friend. It may be with your boss at work. It may be with some acquaintance of yours. It may be with yourself. But let me tell you, if you've got enough faith to get out in the road and touch Jesus, he can heal you of your issue. Hallelujah. There is a woman who suffered with an uncontrolled bleeding disease for 12 long years. Twelve is the number of government in Scripture. Anytime you find twelve, you'll find, you'll find God explaining government. It's a foundation. It's something that's built on. Twelve years. Twelve years. It's twelve foundations to the city of glory. And on them twelve foundations are the name of the twelve apostles. Somebody say amen. The foundations. Every, the foundations have twelve names on them. Twelve foundations. Woo. There are twelve. There are, there are twelve there are 12 tribes in the Old Testament. It is the foundation for the church of the Old Testament. In the New Testament church, there are 12 apostles. 
which is the foundation being laid by Jesus Christ, which is for the church and the New Testament church, both for the Jew and the Greek. But in heaven, as you see him worship, it says how many elders? The 24 elders. 12 times 12 is 24. So John got a glimpse of the Old Testament church and the New Testament church throwing their crowns down before the Lord Jesus and worshiping him and thanking him for laying the foundation for both the Old Testament church that Moses shepherded, hallelujah, and throughout that time and then brought it into the New Testament in which we are part of right now. And by the way, the Old Testament church blended in with the New Testament church. They come along and, and they just followed over into the New Testament church. They didn't leave them behind. They didn't leave them behind because when Jesus, oh my God, I'm going to preach this morning. When Jesus went into the place of captivity, the Bible said he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. So for years in the Old Testament church when people died, they didn't go to heaven. They went to a place called paradise. They went to a place called paradise. And when Jesus died, hallelujah to God, he went into paradise and bankrupted it. I mean, and opened the door and let everybody in there that had faith, that had faith in tomorrow, that had faith in the future, that had faith in God, who had faith in Christ and had not seen him as of yet. They died not having received the promise. My God, is anybody hearing me here today? They died not having received the promise. The promise isn't just eternal life in heaven with God. But the promise was there is one coming. John the Baptist says, whose shoes I am not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Isaiah says that when he, oh my God, he, there is nothing when he comes in it that we should desire of him. He is a man, oh my God, acquainted with grief. Oh yes, but his stripes are going to heal you and when they bruise him, our iniquity shall be taken away. Hallelujah to his name. On that day when Jesus passed and he died, the Bible said he went into the heart of the earth and for three days, whoo, the only way I can describe it is in evangelistic term. For three days he had a revival in paradise. And Abraham, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, every patriarch, every prophet of the Old Testament, every man and woman and boy and girl that died believing, have a, hallelujah, in faith, having not received the promise. Say that with me. Having not received the promise, having not received the promise, having not received the promise, they died, but they had faith when they died. And their faith was strong enough to keep them until the promise could come get this Whew. I hope you got some paper because I'm going to shoot some stuff at you they all died in faith not having received the promise there they were kept can you see a few days, a few moments before then. Hmm. Everyone is, has died. Jesus is about to hang his head on Golgotha and say two words that rocked hell itself. It, or three words, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. Now, right before then, there was a man on one side of him and a man on the other side. One man said and mocked him. If he was who you were, you wouldn't be here to start with. You can't save yourself. You can't save us. Come on, somebody. The other man said, Lord, remember, hey, remember when, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Remember me, Jesus. Remember me. Oh, my. I just believe this. One person said, well, well, they, they broke him. They didn't break a bone in his body, according to the Scripture. When they come along and seen, the Roman soldier looked at him and saw that he had already dead, and they break not his legs so that the Scripture would be filled. And not one bone shall be broken. Are y'all with me? Say amen. 
But I just got to believe this in paradise that day. I mean on the verge of him being there and coming there just a few moments probably before Jesus gave up the ghost and walked into the underworld as we know it. And, and most mythology and most religions accept that there is a place where the dead are kept. They just don't go further into it. They were kept there. All the men and women of faith up to that point in the Old Testament. For 4,000 years, they had all died in faith, having not received the promise. Mm. I can see them now when the door opened up that day. And a guy walked in and everybody standing around in thousands, maybe millions. A man walks in and he's got holes in his hand too. When he walks in, they said, hey, 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 are you that Christ that's coming? That thief on the cross that had enough faith to believe in him while he was dying said, no, nope, it wasn't me, but he's about to come through the door. Because the last time I checked, he was giving up the ghost right along with me while we was hanging on that cross. Are y'all hearing me here today? At about that time, the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah walked through the door of death and hell itself. And they all looked at him and they said, are you the one? He said, oh, I'm the one. I'm the one that you died in faith believing that would come. I'm the one, I'm the promise that the Father gave all the way back to Adam in the very beginning in the garden when he said to Satan, hallelujah, you shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. Hallelujah, I am that promise one I am the promise that you held on to see and I'm telling you I don't know nobody knows what happened for three days there but all I know while they were there I believe Jesus preached like just like he did here and the Bible said he preached to the spirits that were in prison somebody say amen I'm not telling you something ain't in the Bible most people, most preachers scared to preach about it because they got controversy behind it. I ain't because the Bible authenticates what I'm saying here today. Somebody say amen. Why are you saying all this? Because I'm bringing you up to something. The Bible says after three days, when Jesus arose, you know, there's some things we skip over in the Scripture. When Jesus arose, not only, not only did his grave open up, but the Bible said some of the saints' graves in Jerusalem opened up. And they saw the saints again walking down the Oh, my God. That ain't what I said. That's what the book says. Am I right? So when Jesus rocked hell, the grave itself, and robbed it of its inhabitants, he robbed it after he preached to them, and they said, yeah, this is our faith. This is the conclusion of our faith. Christ is the conclusion. He is the promise of what we died believing and looking for. <laughs> we died believing and looking for the Christ. The Bible said he led captivity captive. And he, get this, and he gave, and he gave gifts unto men. It's interesting to note that no one had ever heard of an apostle. No one, well, we'd heard of prophets, but no one had ever heard of an apostle. That name had never come. That's a New Testament name. No one had ever heard of that. Are, are y'all with me? Is everybody awake in this place? If you awake, shout amen. No one had ever heard of an apostle. We'd heard of prophets. No one had ever heard of the name evangelist. We'd heard, heard the word pastor, but it was in shepherd form. Teacher wasn't even used. And all of a sudden now, he leads these captive people up that, that death had a hold of. 
holding them, waiting for the promise. Three days of revival in the heart of the earth. I bet hell was on red alert when Jesus was preaching in the heart of the earth. I bet it sounded like a megaphone going out of his voice preaching hallelujah. Death having to stand over in the corner and bow his head and say, I can't touch that. I tried to hold him in the ground, but tr you can nail truth to a tree but three days later it's coming out of the ground hallelujah to God Whew. he leads captivity captive and he gives gifts unto men this is what I personally believe happened for the New Testament church to be gifted I believe the gifts that were in the patriarchs the prophets and the men and women of God of faith in the Old Testament that never had a name was named and given to the New Testament church as apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I believe that the gifts of healings and miracles that operated in the Old Testament is now named, hallelujah, by God himself and given to a New Testament church. Because here's what I understand. If it took faith to keep the Old Testament church until Jesus came, it's going to take faith to keep the New Testament church until Jesus comes. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? If it took, if it took the things and the signs and the wonders of God that we find throughout the Old Testament, Testament that God visited his people time and time and time and time again. Hey, he parted the water. He gave a manna in the wilderness and quail by the day. Water from a flinty rock caused the shoes to grow on the feet and the clothes to close the mouth of the lions. Paul, oh my God. Paul said, raise sons by the prophet back to life again. Oh, somebody shout yes, hallelujah. If it took those demonstrations to convince them of faith that they were in the right vein the whole time. It kept them and God showed them enough for them to believe and hold on until they could see the promise. But the scripture says that God having something better for us. That the Lord has provided something better for us. I didn't say that. That's what the Bible says. That without them or with them without us cannot be made perfect. That word there means complete. And as I rode to church this morning, I said, God, what am I saying? What am I seeing in the Scripture here? You mean to tell me they're waiting on us? He said, they, they will either praise you or condemn you when you come into my presence in that day. I said, what do you mean? He says, Something better for you is the Christ that's come. His gifts, the mysteries. I talked about them last week. I've not seen, ear not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of a man. What God hath prepared for them that love him, but he hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. They didn't have the Holy Ghost. Oh, my God. They didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which was an assurance and a down payment from Christ himself that he was king and Lord of the church and the head of the body. It is the down payment for you that he will one day come back and receive you because it is the earnest of your inheritance. It is a down payment of his love in your life. He said, but they won't be complete until you are complete. Do y'all see that? What they started will not finish until we get there. And they're going to look at us. And some are going to sleek and hold their head down. And them patriarchs and them elders who didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Who never seen Jesus. Who never touched him who never had the word we have, 
and the church to go to and the body of Christ. Are y'all with me? When you stand there and you say, well, I just couldn't because my refrigerator broke on Saturday and it made me backslide on Sunday. And they go look at you and you say, me, tell me that we were sawn in half and they stoned us and they beat us and you couldn't hold on. We didn't have half of what you had to go on if we could have had that. Woo! Think about it. And we stand there giving God excuses why we could not. They're going to condemn us because we had the same. Get this. We got the same faith that they had. Jude said, contend for the faith that was once delivered to who? The saints. Them. Go for it. Reach out for it. Somebody grab it. Get it. I'll dare say this. There's a lot of things floating around in the church today. It's got faith on it, but it ain't faith. I said it ain't faith. It's feel good, but it ain't faith. It's fanaticism. It's not faith. It's a form of faith, but it ain't real faith. Somebody say amen. It's charisma. It ain't faith. Real faith will pull heaven down to your house and to your doorstep. Real faith will pull a healing into your life. Real faith will cause you to walk softly and closely to God. Real faith will cause you to obtain what the world calls foolishness. Real faith will put you in line to receive what everybody else says they got to receive based on their education and, and, and their ingenuity. Uh, uh, no, real faith puts you in line with the gifts of heaven and the glory of God and the healing of Jesus Christ. Real faith lines you up for a generation after you to be blessed and they ain't even in nobody's belly yet, but the seed is ready and your descendants, hallelujah, are depending on you to have faith in God because that faith is something that carries over year after year, millennial after millennial. It doesn't die. It doesn't go away. You can't bury it. You can't put sands of time on it. It's God's way. Hallelujah. And we use our faith so frivolously for such, for things that don't matter. And when it comes time to step up to the plate, we strike out. Come on, children. Take that faith and begin to exercise. Faith is like a muscle in a bodybuilder's body. He don't pump no iron, it don't get big. Faith is that way in a Christian's life. You don't use it, it don't get big. He has dealt to every man a measure of faith. He didn't give me no more than he gave you. And he didn't give you no more than he gave Sister Trace in the back. And he didn't give, my God, he didn't give Sonia no more than he gave Lisa. And he didn't give Arthur no more than he gave Mark. It's how we use it. And it's how we put it to the place of usability with God's word through obedience that makes it large or Small. And don't tell me that everybody has the same level of faith. They do not. Just because you're a Christian don't mean you're on the same level as everybody else in the body of Christ when it comes to faith. Somebody help me in here today. He says to Luke, he says to the to the man here standing in the road waiting on Jesus, he just Oh, God help me today. Oh, God. He's standing in the road. He's had a delay. My daughter is dying. How many of you just, just stood there, just would have stood around and lollygagged until your number came up? Let me tell you right now, that would have been John Caleb. He'd have been homesick that bad on the verge of dying. Let me tell you, I, I probably would have told that lady with the issue of blood, hold on, Sue. I got something that's pressing me. I, I got to get to him. I got to 
touch him. Uh, something got to happen. Uh, somebody that I love is going through a time. And, and if, if, it's ne- if you're not careful, I may lose this moment. But he's patient. And all the story, you know, transpires. She touches his hem, virtue leaves and goes into the woman. She hides. He calls her. What I like is he calls her daughter. Nowhere in the scriptures her name mentioned, but nowhere in the scriptures no one one woman preached more about than any woman that I ever known of than that woman right there. Oh, somebody say amen. Jesus said before, I'm just going to give you this little bit. You've heard me say it before, but it's worth saying again. He said to them, somebody, somebody shout somebody. Mm, somebody touch me. What do you mean somebody touched you? Everybody's touching you. No, everybody's touching God, but ain't everybody receiving from God. There is a touch that gets you to receive from God. There are a lot of people can touch him, but then there's some people that touch him. Do y'all know what I'm saying? I mean, some people touch him because everybody's touching him. That's the thing to do. It's a Hollywood style of Jesus. Let's just get in because everybody's doing it. Let's just jump in the pool because everybody's jumping in the pool. I didn't jump in salvation because everybody else was getting saved. I got in it because I got in the road and I had an issue. And if I didn't get touched by God, I wasn't going to make it. Can I get an amen? Hello, somebody. She touched him. She tried to hide. Hmm. She come to him, told him the story. I ain't going to go through it. I ain't got time. Told him the story of what happened. He said to her daughter, it's interesting. She went from somebody, nobody. She was a nobody before she came in the street. Because she had an issue of blood, according to the Levitical law, she didn't supposed to sit nowhere, and everybody to sit in the seat that she sat in was ceremonially unclean. They had an offer of sacrifice up, and for seven days couldn't go to church. Hello, somebody. That's the Bible. And her blood, if you touched her, if you touched her, and she had a disease, you become, you become a participant with her disease, which made you unclean as well. So everybody obviously had ostracized her and put her away. But she had enough faith. Somebody lift your hand and say, give me that kind of faith, oh God. Hallelujah. She had enough faith to get in the road. Hallelujah. And run the risk of being stoned. Run the risk of having a trial. Run the risk of being ostracized and isolated outside of the camp. Spent all her money. Had no friends, probably. Her living was gone. Retirement's out. 401K's been spent. Social Security ain't even kicked in yet. Somebody help me in the building. I'm just telling you, she's, she's between a rock and a hard place, and the rock's coming down harder. And she touches Jesus. And while all this is going on, Jairus is sitting over there like, oh, my God, if he don't hurry up and get to my house, the thing that I love the most is going to die. And I like what Jesus, whoo, when you're dealing with Jesus, folks, their help for you can only help you as long as there's breath in your body. But I found something out about Jesus. Jesus don't have to have breath in your body to help you when you have a need that great. And as he's sitting over there impatient, man, wondering what's going on at home, the word come. Don't even bother the mama and shut up my kataya. Don't even bother the master. She's already gone. Jesus Jesus turns to him and he said if you can only believe all things are possible y'all ain't hear it if y'all have heard that about 25 people would have jumped up and ran right then if you can only believe but wait a minute she's gone they, it's been verified they, they, they looked at her her color is out it, her breath is gone but when you're dealing with Jesus you are never without hope and you always He's got a chance that what's impossible with man is possible with God. Hallelujah to his name. Go. So he goes. He goes to her house. And to Jerry's house. And there that damsel lays. Twelve years old. Woman got an issue of blood for 12 years. The young girl, 12 years old. I'm going to build a foundation of healing 
And I'm going to build a foundation to raise the folk from the dead. <laughs> Twelve. It's the number of government. It's the number, it's the number of strength. It's the number of foundation. It's the number you can set something else on, and it's all right. It'll hold it up. So every day after that day when Jarius got up and his daughter probably lived for I don't know how long, maybe she lived to 65, Jarius probably said to her, don't worry about dying any longer, daughter, because the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Hallelujah to God. You don't have to worry about it no longer because Jesus has bore this up on him. And your life came because of his life. Your touch came because of his touch. Only, touch your neighbor and say, only believe. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it while I'm preaching. I want you to take your piece of paper out right now. If you ain't got a piece, bar piece. Get you a pen, get you a pencil, piece of paper. Get you a pencil. This is going to be real easy today. Normally I'd say three things or four things. But on that piece of paper with no one looking except the eyes of Almighty God, I want you to write on that piece of paper one thing that you want God to do that no one else can do. But God, one thing, one thing, write it down. Some of you saying, well, I wonder who's going to get it. No, it ain't going to be me. You ain't going to put this one in the prayer box. You need to keep this one. Because if you're writing it down right now by faith under the influence of the anointing and your spirit is transparent with God, and you got enough faith to write it down, God's got enough power to deliver on it. Y'all didn't hear that. If you got enough faith and belief to write it down and believe it, God's got enough power to make it happen to come into your life. Write it down. He goes in to Jairus' house. He shuts the door. He takes everybody and puts them out. Let me tell you something. They just sometime God don't need help from people. And some of y'all facing some things that God don't want you to invite the prayer group into. He don't need, uh, he don't need the, the phone tree hooked up to your problem. Matter of fact, he's saying, shut the door and let me go in there and, and do this thing for you. So, and, I, and, and, and I thought long and hard about it. I said, why did Jesus... Take all the people out of the room that, I mean, I know they didn't have faith and they doubted. But let, let, me, let me be honest with you. Could that really, could that really hold him back? To some degree it may because they limited him in Nazareth because of their unbelief. And the Bible said there, 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 there in Nazareth, he could only heal a few sick folk. That's the Bible. When he comes to God, God's omnipotent and he's omnipresent. He can do what he wants to. And I'll be honest with you, he don't have to have our faith, but he chooses to use our faith in order to bring what he's got into our life and into our world. He shuts the door and goes in by himself. And I'm thinking the whole time, and, and just last night when I was reading this, I thought, you know what, God, here's the whole thing. Peter brought Peter in there and John and James and Matthew and Andrew and Bartholomew and the disciples that was with him. If he'd have prayed, if they'd have helped him pray, they could have walked out there with pride and ego and said, you know what, I had a hand in that miracle. I had a hand in raising them from the dead. And sometimes when God does something for you, he does it without no one else looking except him. And when the door opens up again, that baby ain't dead. She's walking on all two feet. She's hungry. She's needing some lunch can somebody say amen sometime when God does some things for you he does it hallelujah in an obscure way behind closed doors with the shades pulled down so that nobody gets the glory but his name and his person nobody gets that glory 
Sometime, I believe this, sometime he puts us out of the room. He said, now you pray, now get out. And the next time I open this door, that that you need and you believe in and you love will be standing. I'll be standing here getting ready to hug your neck. Oh, my God. How mercy. See, that's the thing about Jesus. When he shut the door, she was dead. When he opened the door, she was alive. That's just how fast. Whoa. That's just how fast your life can change. When you shut the door coming here, it was dead. But now you open the door. My God, it's alive. How did that take place. I'll tell you faith in God. Faith in God. Faith in God. I dare say we are in a deficit of this one commodity that has been given to us by Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul said to the early church, he said, all men, all men don't have faith. Hey, some men don't have it. Let's just go ahead and say it. Some men don't have it. They don't have it. They come to church. What they got ain't faith. They complain. They ain't got faith. They worry. They ain't got faith. Boy, it's quiet in here today, ain't it? Mm -mm -mm. Faith. Fear not, he says to Jairus. Only only believe and she shall be made whole. Only believe. Oh, my. I wrote some notes. I ain't sure I want to go to them. Maybe I need to. Mm, mm, mm. He demanded faith. Christ demands faith. Today, yes, God, I wrote this. Yes, God will save anyone who believes. Very simple. We hear it all the time. We used to. We don't hear it no more. We got too deep to quote it. But it's the greatest scripture in all the word of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever think right process it all right what did he say was the what was the whole thing about being saved what did you have to do to be saved believe why have we complicated that thing why have we complicated it in the realms of evangelical circles why are we having to give people 12 points to come to Jesus one point believe him my God believe him if you're a drunkard believe him if you're a prostitute believe him if you're homeless, believe him. If your mind feels like it's in a million different places at one time, believe God and he will stop your storm. He will deliver your soul. He will set you free. Can I get an amen from some free people in this room here today? We cannot approach God except by faith. The Word of God declares that faith is invaluable and indispensable. For without faith, it is impossible to please Him. But he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a reward of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 and 6. That blind Bartimaeus by the roadside, he said, Go thy way. I like this. Thy faith, thy faith, thy faith hath made thee whole. Mark 10, hallelujah. To the two blind men in Matthew 9, he asked the question, Believe, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I am able to open up your eyes? Do you believe that I'm able to do exceeding abundant above all that you can ask or think? They said to him, Yea, Lord. Two words. Transform their life. Then he touched their eyes saying, According, I like this, According to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were 
opened. Now, he didn't say according to my power, my ability, which he had. The question ain't his ability. The question is, do I believe it or not? The question isn't, is God powerful enough to do it, Brother Rod? The question is, where is my faith? It is available. His power is ready. His anointing is ready. It is straining toward us right now. It is reaching toward our impossibility. The question isn't, is God big enough, well enough, capable enough? Oh, no. He is all of that. The question is, do we have enough faith to believe in the impossible? Do we? Can I tell you something? Every day that you live, there is an assault from hell on this area of your life. The devil don't care if you sing. He don't care if you serve in the church. He just wants you to doubt what the Holy Ghost has put in your heart through the Word of God that came from the lips of Jesus Christ. He just wants to throw you a curveball every once in a while. To make you slide that little bit of unbelief and doubt in there. Because if he can get that in there, next thing you know, you're not just doubting him about a payment on your car. You're doubting him about the salvation of your children and your grandchildren. Somebody say amen. He is trying to shipwreck our faith. I like that word the Apostle Paul used. He said he is ship trying to shipwreck, shipwreck. Our, somebody say shipwreck. Shipwreck our faith, which gives me the idea that faith is a boat. Faith is a ship. And the whole thing it is is carrying up. Oh, my God. It's carrying us to our destination. It's carrying our loved ones, our families, our futures to its destination. And Satan says, if I can knock a hole in their faith boat, then everything they'll do, it'll sink. Their dreams, their visions, their family, their children, their grandchildren from here to the future will go down. But the devil is a lie in the name of Jesus. Because what he didn't see was when he blasts them cannons of doubt toward my ship, that cannonball from hell hits a force field called the Holy Ghost. And when it does, it says, Pwop! Down that thing, sit. Next thing you know, he, here comes another. And I'm inside the boat worrying, oh God. He said, look at here, son, I got this. I, I got this because the battle is not yours. It is it is mine. All I told you to do was get on the boat. All I told you to do was sail. All I, I didn't ask you to drive the ship. I didn't ask you to get the directions. I didn't ask you to I didn't ask you to row the boat. I just told you to get on board. I, and I would take you to your destination. Touch somebody and say, get on board. Touch somebody and say, quit trying to be the captain. They said when the Titanic sank, the captain had went away for a time of relaxation. He left the wheel and put the, most, the more inexperienced men in charge. And they didn't see what was just ahead. That almost killed the entire crowd on the boat. But I will tell you this. Jesus is not leaving the place of the captain. And when men's eyes grow dim and dull, and when the first mate is sleepy, the captain is still looking ahead because I'm on this old ship of Zion they used to sing. And I used to hear them sing, get on board, get on board. They sing it like this. King Jesus is the captain. King Jesus, he is the captain. Oh, King Jesus, he is 
the captain. Get on board, children. Get on board. If you're on that ship, lift your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah to God. Oh, he demanded faith. He asked for it. But there was no question about his power or ability. All power, he said, is given unto him and to me in heaven and in earth. It's not a matter of whether or not he is able to do it. The matter is, can we believe that he's able to do it? What things you ever desire when you pray? Here's my scripture, Mark 11. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them. And they might come. Help me, Bible people. I'm going to see if you're awake. They might show up. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, what does it take? Believe. Somebody shout that word out real loud. Believe. Believe you receive them, 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 whatever things you're desiring. Those things. Believe you receive them when, then. If you ain't got now faith, you ain't got no faith. Now faith. Woo! If the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now faith. What's the things you desire when you pray, when you pray, when you pray? When are you praying? Right at that moment. At that moment. What's the things you desire when you pray? Believe you receive them and ye shall. Come on, church people. And ye shall what? That ain't what I said. That's what Jesus said. And he is the authority on prayer and faith and belief. And why do we not have what we've asked for? Well, that's a whole other message right there. I believe it all boils down to our belief. It ain't, it ain't confusing. It's just the fact that we don't believe like we claim we do. Now, we shout all over this room. But shouting is not the prerequisite of getting things from God. Because sooner or later, your shout going to give up. And your feet ain't going to be moving. And one of these days, you're going to walk in the doctor's office, and you ain't going to feel like shouting. And they're going to look at you and say something that you ain't ready for. And if you ain't got nothing but a dance and a song, you may get out. You may not make it. That's why your faith has got to be in the word of a living God. Because when men say no, you got to know God says yes. My, my, my. Anybody get anything this morning? If he demands faith, you heard me talk about this some few weeks back, then they're just going to live by it. If he demands faith, he demands it in a life. Not just once, but every day. I've heard people say, I just don't have any faith. I can't believe it's true. Some of them don't. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 2, all men have not faith, Paul said. I just quoted it to you. There's the scripture, 2 Thessalonians 3 and 2. Write it down. Here Paul is not speaking of just Christians. The preceding portion of this verse will show that he is talking about unreasonable and wicked men that is in our world trying to dismantle our faith like this gentleman that's telling the whole world with his listeners that God will not heal and God will not do this. Let me tell you one thing. You will stand before God, mister. And they won't nobody have to preach no sermon to you to tell you that he is real. When you look on that face that burns with fire and them eyes, hallelujah, pierce your soul, you will be sad to know that you should have instructed people to believe in a God they could not see except through the eyes of faith. 
I say to you, mister, whoever you are, if you get to watch this thing, I'm, I just pray that you get to flipping through things and all of a sudden you come across this little old preacher down here in North Augusta. I say to you, be born again so that your eyes can be opened and your heart can be touched. Quit dabbling in things you don't understand. You might dabble in the physical, but you're in the spiritual world now. Lead the spiritual things to spiritual people. Leave it alone. Either get in or get out of it. But don't fool with it. My mama used to say, don't mess with no fire because it'll burn you. Come on, somebody. I mean, don't mess with no fire. That thing will burn you. I mean, hey, don't get that close. It'll burn you.